Hello, ladies and gents. Welcome back to the channel. Sorry it's been a little bit quiet recently, but uh, hopefully uh, we're getting back into the swing of things a little bit after the, the madness of uh, James the first week. Uh, now, we're back today to look at someone um, who uh, has been quite important to my studies over the years. Uh, we're looking at John Barber, Archdeacon of Aberdeen, who died um, either on this day or possibly um, on the 14th of March uh, in 1395. Now, John Barber, uh, the Archdeacon of Aberdeen, he um, is most famous for producing a long narrative poem uh, known as The Bruce. Here's, uh, here's my copy again, folks. Um, produced that in, a, well, in the mid-1370s. We might get on to um, some of the problems with dating that a little bit later in the video. Um, but certainly, uh, writing in, in the 1370s, his, his uh, poem recounting the life of Robert Bruce and some of his closest associates, particularly uh, the good Sir James Douglas, um, Thomas Randolph, the Earl of Murray, uh, the King's nephew, and the King's younger brother, Edward Bruce, Earl of Carrick. Now it is this poem, and another later poem, um, the, uh, the Wallace by Blind Harry, that I wrote my PhD on. So today, for the anniversary of Barber's death, I thought we might look quite quickly at um, who Barber was, um, what his poem is all about, and also maybe uh, have a look at some of the themes within the Bruce that I looked at for my thesis. I'm going to put the book down now. Uh, now, Barber himself is, in some senses, kind of an awkward character to um, pin down. Uh, we don't know very much about his early life. He first appears in um, record in 1357 when he is elevated from the presentership of Dunkeld, a, a position pre a presenter of Dunkeld. He's held for a year before that. Um, he's elevated from that position to the Archdeaconry of Aberdeen, which is an office that he will hold for the rest of his days. Uh, it's been speculated that he might uh, have actually come from Dunkeld originally. In the Bruce, he spends some time lionising the memory of William Sinclair, the Bishop of Dunkeld, the fighting Bishop of Dunkeld, he's sometimes known as, partly because of uh, the work Barber actually does in, in, um, in elevating uh, Bishop Sinclair's um, reputation, martial reputation. Uh, so it's been suggested that maybe he might come from uh, Dunkeld originally, or that he might have had some association with the bishop, uh, maybe grew up uh, in the bishop's household and so forth, but uh, we, d we don't really know. Uh, that surname, Barber, would suggest that he or, or one of his uh, recent um, ancestors had been a, a barber surgeon, uh, which would suggest a kind of relatively low-class artisanal background. Um, and uh, the only uh, jobs within the church, he is, he is of course a cleric, um, the only jobs we know though within the church that he ever had were as presenter at um, Dunkeld and then of course Archdeacon of Aberdeen. Now Archdeacon is not um, a, a, a low status office by any stretch of the imagination, it's, it's basically the kind of office directly under the Bishop of Aberdeen himself, but that's as high within the church hierarchy as Barber ever gets. So his clerical career is hardly stellar, it's hardly all that exciting. Um, so if it weren't for his literary output, we might not really remember Barber, might not really think about him to, um, uh, you know, think of him as, as a particularly uh, important or prominent figure within 14th century Scotland. Uh, however, Barber did enjoy within his lifetime a relatively close association with King Robert II of Scotland. That's, that's Robert I's grandson, Robert Bruce's grandson. 
Um, we know, for instance, that on several occasions he served as uh, Auditor of the Exchequer, or one of the Auditors of the Exchequer, under Robert II's royal administration. In 1378, Barber received a £1 annuity drawn from the, um, from, uh, the revenues of, of the borough of Aberdeen, um, received from the king, and in that, in the, in the grant of that annuity, was referred to at, by King Robert as our beloved clerk. Uh, and in 1388, that one pound annuity was actually increased to 10 pounds annually that uh, Barber was um, uh, permitted to draw from the, the burgle revenues of Aberdeen. The Bruce is the only one of Barber's written works to survive to us, but we do know of at least one, possibly three, other Stuart genealogies that uh, Barber produced. These are referenced in uh, later writings of uh, Andrew of Winton and also Walter Bauer, both writing in the early uh, 15th century. So, uh, as you can imagine, writing these, these genealogies of the Stuarts, this again ties Barber into uh, the, the kind of wider circle, the wider affinity of uh, Robert II. These, although they don't survive, they seem to have been efforts to draw, um, uh, co connect uh, the, the contemporary Stuarts, uh, the new King of Scots and his family, into a lineage that dated all the way back to the foundations of Scotland and beyond, back uh, even to the, the fall of Troy. Um, this has led uh, many historians to, I think quite understandably, suggest that the Bruce, which of course is an attempt to, um, to lionise and exaggerate the reputation of Robert II's grandfather, Robert I, it's, it's been suggested on the basis of this very clear Stuart association that Barber has, that, uh, or had, that Barber was writing on behalf of Robert II and was in fact patronised by Robert II to produce the Bruce. That's the kind of standard traditional interpretation of why Barber writes and who for. Now there are other interpretations out there uh, as, I, as I intimated slightly earlier in the video, the likes of uh, James Douglas, the good Sir James, or Thomas Randolph, the Earl of Murray, are at least Murray rather, are at least as prominent, as important, uh, as much the heroes of the Bruce as King Robert is. They all, of course, had their own descendants living in the 1370s. In the case of um, the good Sir James, one of his descendants, his own illegitimate son, is, alongside Robert II, the only contemporary figure, the one of only two, Robert II and, and, and um, Archibald the Grim, the good Sir James's son, uh, two contemporary figures to be referenced within the text of Barber's Bruce. Now, if we take this as suggesting that perhaps Archibald the Grim may have had some hand in the production of the Bruce, may have stumped up some of the money that encouraged Barber to produce his work. Uh, I might suggest, and I'll, uh, I may put in, in the uh, description below some, some links to some previous blog posts uh, where I, I talk about this maybe in a little bit more detail, um, I think actually p perhaps the interpretation that sees someone like Archibald the Grim as being uh, the the uh, patron behind the Bruce um, maybe has a little bit more explanatory power, is maybe a little bit more convincing. Uh, not least because I would suggest that it is easier to believe that someone like Archibald the Grim writing in the, or, or, or paying for Barber to write in the 1370s, might want um, Barber to produce something that lionises both the memory of Archibald's father, the good Sir James, and 
lionises the memory of the King's grandfather, Robert I, I find that a little bit easier to believe than the notion that Robert II is paying for a work that is designed to lionise his own grandfather, um, who, who, you know, Robert personally remembers, uh, and also paying to lionise the memory of um, James Douglas, who has no familiar, or, well, not no familial collections, but rather slim familial collections to, uh, connections rather, to Robert II, um, and whose descendants, um, the likes of Archibald Graham or William I Earl of Douglas, have not always sat terribly well alongside um, Stuart Power, um, and have not always necessarily been on the same side um, as Robert II in, in various um, political goings-on in the past um, 60 years or so since the events that are being recounted in the Bruce. However, regardless of who we think may have been holding the purse strings, regardless of who we think uh, may have been um, patronising Barber, it is undoubtedly the case that Barber was writing um, for a predominantly aristocratic audience, for the king, for the royal court, and for the upper echelons of the Scottish nobility. Now he is writing at a time, as I say, in the 1370s when tensions are very much on the increase between Scotland and England, and the likelihood of armed conflict and outright war is ever increasing. Now this ties into one of the main themes that I looked at in my thesis, because one of Barber's primary interests is in chivalry, is in uh, ideas surrounding a uh, perfect idealised knighthood, what makes someone a great knight, what made Robert Bruce and James Douglas and Thomas Randolph and Edward Bruce the greatest knights of their generation. And what Barber uh, has to say on that subject, how Barber presents such men as being the greatest knights of their generation, I would argue, and have argued quite extensively in that piece of work there, the thesis, um, uh, says something about Scottish expectations um, in the 1370s. Uh, it, it anticipates, I think, Barber anticipates um, some of the challenges that might well be facing the Scots very soon, might very well be facing his audience. Remember, these uh, the, the upper echelons of the Scottish nobility who would be expected to act as the kingdom's war leaders in the event that another war broke out. So for example, um, Barber's perfect knight is bold and brave and strong, but they govern their boldness, their bravery, with intelligence. The greatest knights in Barber's Bruce are not just courageous, they are prudent. They are good at seeing what can be done, um, avoiding what can't be done, and figuring out how exactly they are going to achieve their own particular aims. They are willing to use both strength and guile in order to uh, accomplish their uh, goals. They are not above setting traps and ambushes. They are not above coming up with clever ruses and stratagems to overcome the garrisons of English castles rather than just flinging men against the walls hoping that sooner or later more of the enemy will die than they do and they'll take their place. Uh, now this, I would suggest, reflects the realities of Anglo-Scottish warfare, Ang Anglo-Scottish warfare rather, at the time, um, and amounts in a sense to, in a sense, to a kind of appeal to um, the audience for which he is writing. You know, an audience um, who were expected to be up to their knees in that kind of conflict should it ever um, come. Uh, another way in which Barber, uh, Barber's concerns reflect perhaps 
the contemporary concerns of his audience uh, comes in the form of his emphasis on loyalty. Barber very famously claims that with loyalty and one other virtue a man may yet be sufficient, but without virtue uh, none may have worth. Uh, loyalty is a key feature of um, the, the uh, Bruce and all of his heroes, uh, King Robert, James Douglas, Thomas Randolph, um, all of them love loyalty and, by contrast, hate treason um, and untrustworthiness um, and um, react very strongly um, against those who they see as being um, disloyal and dishonest. Now that again ties into the sort of conflict that might be expected in the 1370s. Um, by this point we have had the First and Scottish Wars of Independence, the most recent experience the Scottish political community has had with Anglo-Scottish warfare has been typified by quite frequent switching of sides. Um, and this is particularly worrisome for the Scots because the Scots, of course, have fewer resources and less manpower than their southern neighbours. English service can very often be more lucrative for your average Scot in the medieval period, um, and certainly for your average Scottish nobleman, than it might be staying with the Scots. And so we see Barber here again addressing this concern um, that the Scots need to stick together, they need to encourage the community to hang together and, and stand tough against the English um, rather than being lured away by the promise of um, perhaps more lucrative rewards or perhaps just an easier time of things. Um, and this, I think, perhaps accounts for Barber's um, uh, emphasis and interest, particular, but particularly in this idea of loyalty. Now those are just a couple of ideas and as you can imagine there's um, you know 10,000 words sitting there on the bookshelf behind me um, on the subject of chivalry and Barber's Bruce so I, I guess I don't want to say too much more than that. Um, I will put links in the description as I say there's, there's at least a, 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 a Barber blog post that I'll stick in there that will give you uh, maybe a little bit uh, more context on some of the information I've given you here. Um, and I might stick my Archibald the Grim uh, blog post in there which will give you some stuff maybe about um, the, uh, the, uh, that issue of, of patronage. Um, however folks, um, that's probably enough for me. Uh, so I'm going to let you go now. Thank you very much for listening. Um, hopefully this may have piqued your interest about this uh, barber chap. Um, this um, uh, edition, this uh, the, the Canongate Barber's Bruce, um, edited and translated by uh, Archibald the Grim, is very worth, very much worth hunting out if you get a chance. Um, it has both the original early Scots um, and a facing page translation in modern English. Um, so if you do ever fancy um, having a look in more depth at what Barber has to say. Do, uh, I, I would strongly encourage you to try and get your hands on, on uh, this edition, the Canongate edition. Um, other than that though folks, I think um, I should probably let you go at this point. Thank you very much for uh, listening though and hopefully I'll see you again soon with some more uh, 14th and 15th century Scottish stuff. <laughs> Thank you.